No doubt they will be worried because it has been so long since I have written to them. Mama will be angry and Clara will think that I live in such a whirlwind of joy that I have completely forgotten the sweet angelic image so deeply engraved in my heart and soul. But it's not like that, every day, every hour, I think of you and Clara's charming face returns again and again in my dreams, her transparent eyes look at me sweetly, and her mouth smiles at me as before, when I return to you. Oh my! How could I have written to you with the violence that lurked in my mind and that up to now has disturbed all my thoughts? Something dreadful has entered my life. Gloomy forebodings of a cruel and threatening fate hang over me, like black clouds, impenetrable to the joyful rays of the sun. I must tell you what has happened to me. I have to, it's necessary, but just thinking about it makes me hear mocking laughter around me. Oh, dear Lotario, how can I just try to make you understand that what happened to me a few days ago could have disturbed my life in a terrible way? If you were here you could see with your own eyes, but you certainly think of me now as an absurd visionary. In short, the horrible vision I had, and whose deadly influence I try to avoid, consists simply that a few days ago, specifically on October 30th at noon, a barometer salesman entered my house and offered me his merchandise. I didn't buy anything and I threatened to throw him down the stairs, but he left instantly. You undoubtedly suspect that specific circumstances that have profoundly marked my life give relevance to this insignificant event, and that is indeed the case. I gather all my strength to calmly and patiently tell you some things from my childhood that will bring light and clarity to your spirit. At the moment of beginning I see you laugh and I hear Clara saying, they are real childishness, laugh. Laugh heartily. I beg you. But, God in heaven, my hair stands on end, and it seems to me that I conjure them to mock me in the delirium of despair, as Franz Moore conjured Daniel. Let's go to the fact in question. Except at mealtimes, my brothers and I saw my father very little. He was very busy at work. After dinner, which, according to the old customs, was served at seven o'clock, we would all go, our mother with us, to our father's study, and we would sit at a round table. My father smoked his pipe and drank a large glass of beer. He often told us marvelous stories, and was so passionate about his tales that he let his pipe go out, I was in charge of lighting it again with a splinter on fire, which gave me an indescribable pleasure. He also often gave us picture books, and he remained silent and motionless in his chair, pushing away thick clouds of smoke that enveloped us all like mist. On these types of evenings, my mother was very sad, and as soon as she heard nine o'clock strike, she exclaimed, Come on children, to bed, the Sandman is coming. I can hear it. And, in effect, one could then hear heavy footsteps resounding on the stairs, it must be the Sandman. On one occasion, that noise gave me more chills than usual and I asked my mother as she accompanied us. Hey mom! Who is that evil Sandman that keeps us away from daddy's side? How does it look like? There is no such thing as a Sandman, darling, my mother replied. When I say, the Sandman is coming, I mean that you have to go to bed and that your eyelids close involuntarily as if someone had thrown sand in their eyes. My mother's answer did not satisfy me and my childish imagination guessed that my mother had denied the existence of the Sandman so as not to scare us. But I always heard him coming up the stairs. Full of curiosity, Impatient to make sure of the existence of this man, I asked an old maid who took care of the youngest of my sisters, who was that character. Ah, my little Nathaniel. He answered me, don't you know? 
He is a bad man who comes looking for children when they don't want to go to bed and throws a handful of sand into their eyes making them cry blood. Then she puts them in a sack and takes them to the crescent moon to amuse her children, who wait in the nest and have beaks hooked like owls to peck out their eyes. Since then the image of the Sandman has been terribly imprinted on my mind, and at night, at the moment when the stairs resounded with the noise of his footsteps, he trembled with anxiety and horror, my mother could only then ring out these words choked by my tears, the Sandman. The Sandman. I ran to the bedroom and that terrible apparition tormented me throughout the night. I was old enough to think that the story of the Sandman and his children in the nest of the crescent moon, as told by the old maid, was not entirely accurate, yet the Sandman remained a menacing specter to me. Terror seized me when I heard him go up to my father's office. Sometimes his absence lasted a long time, then his visits became frequent again, that lasted several years. I could not get used to such a strange apparition, and the shadowy figure of that stranger did not pale in my thoughts. His relationship with my father occupied my imagination more and more, the idea of asking him filled me with an insurmountable fear, and the desire to investigate the mystery, to see the legendary Sandman, increased in me with the years. The Sandman had slipped me into the world of the fantastic, where the childish spirit so easily enters. Nothing pleased me as much as reading or listening to horrible stories about genies, witches, and goblins, but, above all the chilling apparitions, he preferred that of the Sandman, which he drew with chalk and charcoal on the tables, on the cupboards, and on the walls in the most hideous shapes. When I was ten years old, my mother assigned me a room to myself, in the corridor, not far from my father's. As always, at the stroke of nine the stranger made himself heard, and they had to retire. From my room I could hear him enter my father's office, and soon after it seemed to me that an imperceptible vapor was spreading throughout the house. Curiosity to see the Sandman in any form was growing in me more and more. Once I opened my door, when my father had already left, and I slipped into the corridor, but I could hear nothing, for the door had always been closed by the time I reached the proper position to see him. Finally, driven by an irresistible desire, I decided to hide in my father's closet and wait right there for the Sandman. From my father's taciturn countenance and from my mother's sadness I knew one night that the Sandman would come. I made an excuse of being enormously tired and leaving the room before nine o'clock I went to hide behind the door. The front door creaked on its hinges, and slow footsteps, slow and menacing, echoed from the hall. Up the stairs. My mother and the children rushed past me. I opened slowly, very slowly, the door of my father's study. He was sitting as usual, silent and with his back to the door. He didn't see me, and I ran to hide behind a curtain that covered a closet where his suits were hung. Then the footsteps were heard getting closer, someone was coughing, snorting and murmuring in a singular way. My heart was pounding with fear and expectation. Very close to the door, a sound step, a violent blow on the handle, the hinges turn noisily. I cautiously move my head forward, the Sandman is in the middle of the room, the glow of the candles illuminates his face. The Sandman, the terrible Sandman, is the old lawyer Capelius who sometimes sits at our table. But the most horrible of faces would not have terrified me more than that of that Capelius. Imagine a broad-shouldered man with a huge misshapen head, a dull complexion, thick gray eyebrows under which two green eyes gleam like a cat's, and a gigantic nose that drops sharply over thick lips. His crooked mouth hunches even more with his smirk, on her cheeks two red spots and accents that are both deaf and whistling escape from between her irregular teeth. 
Capelius always appeared in an ash-colored suit of an old-fashioned cut, jacket and pants of the same color, black stockings, and shoes with rhinestone buckles. Her short wig, which barely covered her neck, ended in two close loops that supported her large ears, of a bright red, and was lost in a wide black taffeta that fanned out here and there on her back, revealing her brooch. Silver that held his lasso. That face was hideous and disgusting, but what shocked us children the most were those big hairy bony hands, when he directed them toward some object, we kept from touching it. He had noticed this and took pleasure in touching the cakes or candied fruits that our mother had stealthily placed on our plates, then he enjoyed seeing our eyes full of tears by not being able to taste the sweets that he had touched due to disgust and revulsion. He did the same on holidays, when our father served us a glass of sweet wine. Then she rushed to take the glass and brought it closer to her bluish lips, and laughed devilishly seeing how we could only express our anger with slight sobs. He used to call us the little animals, in his presence we were not allowed to say a single word and we cursed with all our souls that hateful character, that enemy who deliberately poisoned our smallest joy. My mother seemed to hate disgusting Capelius as much as we did, for from the moment he appeared his sweet gaiety and carefree manner turned to a sad, gloomy gravity. Our father behaved towards Capelius as if he belonged to a higher rank and his rebuffs had to be borne with good spirits. He never stopped offering her her favorite dishes and uncorked reserve wines in her honor. Seeing Capelius then, I realized that no one else could have been the Sandman, but the Sandman was no longer for me that ogre from the tale of the nanny who takes the children to the moon, to the nest of his owl-beaked children. No. It was a hideous and ghostly creature that wherever it appeared brought torment and need, causing lasting, eternal evil. I was as if bewitched, with my head between the curtains, at the risk of being found out and cruelly punished. My father gladly received Capelius. Come on. To work. Exclaimed the other in a muffled voice, taking off his coat. My father, looking somber, took off his robe and the two of them put on black robes. My father opened the door of a built-in cupboard that concealed a deep alcove where there was an oven. Capelius moved closer, and a blue flame rose from the hearth. A host of strange tools lit up in that light. But, my God, what a strange metamorphosis had taken place in my old father's features. A violent and terrible pain seemed to have changed the honest and loyal expression of his countenance, which had contracted satanically. He looked like Capelius. He wielded a pair of incandescent tongs and poked at the glowing coals in the hearth. I thought I saw human figures around him, but without eyes. In their place were black, deep, hideous cavities. Eyes, eyes! cried Capelius in a low, menacing voice. I screamed and fell to the ground, violently struck down with fear. Then Capelius caught me. Little beast. Little beast. He said, gnashing his teeth frightfully. Saying this, he threw me into the furnace, whose flame was already igniting my hair. Now, he exclaimed, we already have eyes, eyes. A beautiful pair of child's eyes and with his hands he took from the hearth a handful of burning coals that he was about to throw into my eyes, when my father, with his hands joined, implored him. Teacher! Teacher! Leave your eyes to my Nathaniel. Leave them to them. Capelius laughed uproariously. May the child keep his eyes so that they do their work in the world, but, since it is here, let us carefully observe the mechanism of its feet and its hands. His fingers squeezed every joint in my limbs, which creaked, and he twisted my hands and feet this way and that. 
this is not quite right. As good as it was. The old man has understood perfectly. Capelius was muttering this while I writhed, but soon everything became dark and confused around me, a nervous pain shook my whole being, I didn't feel anything else. A sweet and warm vapor spilled over my face, I awoke as from the sleep of death. My mother was leaning over me. Is the Sandman here? I stammered. No, my child, it is very far, he's long gone, he won't hurt you. That's what my mother said, and she kissed me holding the beloved child who was returned to her to her heart. Why tire yourself out any longer with these stories, dear Lotario? I was discovered and cruelly mistreated by Capelius. Anxiety and fear caused me a burning fever, which I suffered for some weeks, is the Sandman still here? These were the first words of my salvation and the first sign of my healing. I only have to tell you the most horrible moment of my childhood, later you will have convinced yourself that it is not necessary to accuse my eyes that everything in life seems colorless to me, for a dark fate has raised a thick cloud before all objects, and only my death can dissipate it. Capelius did not appear again, it was said that he had left the city. A year had passed, and one night, according to the old and invariable custom, we were sitting at the round table. Our father was very cheerful and told us funny stories that had happened to him on the trips of his youth. In. Just as the clock struck nine we heard the door hinges click, and heavy footsteps echoed from the hall to the stairs. It's Capelius. Said my mother, turning pale. Yes, it's Capelius, my father repeated, his voice cracking. Tears came to my mother's eyes, Father. Is it accurate? For the last time, he replied. It's coming for the last time, I swear. Go with the children. Good night. I was petrified, I was short of breath. My mother, seeing me motionless, took me by the arm. Come, Nathaniel, he told me. I let myself be taken to my room. Be calm and lie down. Sleep. He told me as he left. But an invincible terror shook me and I could not close my eyes. The horrible, the hateful Capelius was before me, his eyes flashing, smiling hypocritically at me, and I was trying to push his image away. It was close to midnight when a violent blow was heard like the detonation of a firearm. The whole house shook, someone ran past my room, and the front door slammed shut. It's Capelius. I yelled out of myself, and jumped out of bed. I heard moans, I ran to my father's room, the door was open, there was choking smoke, and a maid was shouting. The Lord! The Lord! In front of the burning oven, on the floor, my father lay dead, his face mangled. My sisters, on their knees around her, cried out and wailed. My mother had fallen motionless next to her husband. Capelius, infamous monster! You have murdered my father! I yelled. And I fell senseless. Two days later, when her body was placed in the coffin, her features were as serene and sweet as they had been all her life. That image mitigated my pain, I thought that his alliance with the infernal Capelius had not led him to eternal damnation. The explosion had awakened the neighbors, the event caused a sensation, and the authorities, who learned of it, required the presence of Capelius but he had disappeared from the city without a trace. If I told you, dear friend, that the barometer salesman was none other than the miserable Capelius, you would understand the horror that such an unfortunate and enemy apparition produced in me. I was wearing another suit, 
but Capelius's features are too deeply imprinted on my soul for me to be wrong. Besides, Capelius hasn't even changed his name. He poses here, as I have heard, by a Piedmontese mechanic named Giuseppe Coppola. I am determined to avenge my father's death, come what may. Don't tell my mother about this cruel encounter. Say hello to lovely Clara, I will write to you with greater presence of mind. Stay with God, etc. Clara to Nathaniel. It is true that you have not written to me for a long time but I believe, nevertheless, that you carry me in your soul and in your thoughts, well, you were thinking strongly of me when, wanting to send your last letter to my brother Lotario, you signed it in my name. I opened it with joy and only realized my mistake when I saw these words, Oh, my dear Lotario. I certainly shouldn't have read any further and should have delivered the letter. To my brother. Have you ever reproached me between laughs for having such a peaceful and calm spirit that if the house collapsed, rather than flee, I would put an ill-placed curtain in its place, but I could hardly breathe and everything was spinning before my eyes, my dear Nathaniel, when I learned of the unfortunate cause that has disturbed your life. Eternal separation, never seeing you again, this premonition pierced me like a burning dagger. I read and read again. Your description of the disgusting Capelius is horrible. Thus I have learned the cruel manner in which your old and venerable father died. My brother, to whom I sent what belonged to him, tried to reassure me, without success. The fatal barometer salesman Giuseppe Coppola was chasing me, and I am almost ashamed to admit that he has disturbed, with terrible images, my always deep and peaceful sleep. But suddenly, from the next morning, everything seems different to me. Don't be angry with me, my love, if Lothario tells you that despite your disastrous premonitions about Capelius my serenity is not disturbed at all. I'll tell you honestly what I think. The terrible things you speak of have their origin within yourself, the external and real world has little to do with it. Old Capelius was no doubt repellent, but since he hated children, this produced in you children a real horror of him. The nanny Sandman was associated in your childhood imagination with old Capelius who, without your realizing it, remained in you like a ghost of your early years. His nocturnal interviews with your father were for no other purpose than to carry out experiments in alchemy, which distressed your mother as it possibly cost a lot of money, and that occupation, besides filling her husband with a deceitful hope of wisdom, took him away from the care of his family. Your father undoubtedly caused his death through his own recklessness, and Capelius is not guilty. Would you believe that yesterday I asked an old apothecary neighbor if chemical experiments could cause deadly explosions? He assented, describing to me at length in his own way how such things were done, citing to me a great number of strange words which I have not been able to retain in my memory. Now you are going to be angry with your Clara, you say, in his cold spirit not a single mysterious ray enters, of those that so often embrace man with their invisible wings, she perceives only the colored surface of the world and rejoices like a child at the sight of fruits whose golden shell hides a deadly poison. Ah, my beloved Nathaniel! Don't you think that the feeling of an enemy power that agitates in a fatal way over our being cannot penetrate smiling and serene souls? Forgive me if I, a mere young lady, try to express how I feel at the thought of such a fight. Maybe I can't find the right words and you laugh, not at my thoughts, but at my clumsiness to express them. If there really is a hidden power that so treacherously plunges its claws into us to seize us and drag us down a dangerous path that we would have avoided, if such a force exists, it must bow down to ourselves, for only thus will it win our trust and a place in our hearts the place you need to carry out your work. 
If we have enough firmness, the necessary courage to recognize the path towards which our vocation and our inclinations should lead us, to walk calmly, our inner enemy will perish in the vain efforts it makes to deceive us. It is also true, adds Lotario, that the dark presence to which we surrender frequently creates such attractive images in us that we ourselves produce the deception that consumes us. It is the ghost of our own eye whose influence moves our soul and plunges us into hell or leads us to heaven. Do you realize it, dear Nathaniel? My brother and I have talked of dark forces and powers that to me, after having written, not without effort, the most important thing, appear to me calm, profound. I don't quite understand Lotario's last words, I only sense what he thinks, however, it seems rigorously true to me. I beg you, put the hateful lawyer Capelius and the barometer salesman Coppola out of your mind. Convince yourself that these strange figures have no influence on you. Only the belief in their enemy power makes them enemies. If each line of your letter did not express the deep exaltation of your spirit, if the state of your soul did not grieve my heart, I could joke about your sandman and your alchemist lawyer. Get happy. I have promised myself to be by your side like a guardian angel and to drive the hateful Coppola out of a mad laugh if he came to disturb your sleep. I am not afraid of him at all, neither of him nor of his horrible hands that could not spoil my sweets or throw sand in my eyes. Goodbye, my beloved Nathaniel, etc. I find it very painful that Clara, due to an error caused by my negligence, has broken the seal on my letter and has read it. He has written me an epistle full of profound philosophy according to which he explicitly shows me that Capelius and Coppola only exist within me and that they are ghosts of myself that will be reduced to dust as soon as I recognize them as such. One could never imagine that the spirit that shines in her clear and shuddering eyes, like a delicious dream, is so intelligent and can reason in such a methodical way. It rests on your authority. They've both talked about me together. You have given him a course in logic so that he can see things clearly and with reason. Leave it alone. Besides, it is true that the Coppola barometer salesman is not the old lawyer Capelius. I attend the classes of a physics professor of Italian origin who has just arrived in the city, a famous naturalist named Spallanzani. She has known Coppola for many years and, on the other hand, it is easy to notice her Piedmontese accent. Capelius was a German, but not an honest German. Still, I'm not entirely calm. You and Clara may still think me a gloomy dreamer, but I can't shake the impression Coppola and his hideous face made on me. I'm glad he left town, says Spallanzani. This professor is a singular character, a stocky man with high cheekbones, a pointed nose, and small, penetrating eyes. You could imagine it better than with my description looking at the portrait of Cagliostro made by Katoiaki and that appears in any Berlin calendar, so is Spallanzani. A few days ago, going up to his apartment, I noticed that a curtain that usually covers a glass door was a little apart. I myself do not know how I found myself looking through the glass. A tall, very thin woman, with a harmonious silhouette, magnificently dressed, was sitting with her hands resting on a small table. She was situated in front of the door, and in this way I was able to contemplate her captivating face. She seemed not to notice that he was looking at her, and her eyes were fixed, they seemed not to see, it was as if he slept with his eyes open. I felt so bad that I ran to get into the assembly hall that is right next door. Later I learned that the person I had seen was Spallanzani's daughter, named Olympia, whom he guards jealously so that no one can get close to her. This measure must hide some mystery, and Olympia is undoubtedly flawed. 
But why am I writing these things to you? I could tell you personally. You should know that in two weeks I will be with you. I have to see my angel. To my Clara then the impression that seized me, I confess, on reading your fatal and reasonable letter will be erased. That's why I'm not writing to you today. A thousand hugs, etc. Nobody could imagine something as strange and wonderful as what happened to my poor friend, the young student Nathaniel, and that I am going to tell you about, reader. Haven't you ever felt your interior full of strange thoughts? Who has not felt their blood beating in their veins and a burning red on their cheeks? The glances then seem to search for fantastic and invisible images in space and the words are exhaled in a gasp. In vain friends surround you and ask what is wrong with you. And you would like to paint with its brilliant colors, its shadows and its flashing lights, the vaporous figures that you perceive, and you strive in vain to find words to express your thought. You would like to reproduce with a single word all that these apparitions have of marvelousness, of magnificent, of gloomy horror and of unheard of joy, to shake your friends as if with an electric shock, but every word, every sentence, seems colorless, icy, without life. You search and you search, and you stammer and murmur, and the timid questions of your friends come to hit, like the breath of the wind, your burning imagination until it ends up turning it off. But if you, like a skillful painter, make a quick sketch of such interior images, you can likewise with little effort animate the colors and make them ever brighter, and the various figures fascinate your friends who see you in the middle of the room. World that your soul has created. I must confess that no one has asked me, dear reader, about the story of young Nathaniel, but you know that I belong to that class of authors who, when in the state of mind I have just described, imagine that everyone around him, and even the whole world, asks him, what's wrong with you? Tell us. Thus, a powerful force compels me to speak to you of the fate of Nathaniel. His singular life impressed me, and for this reason I was tormented by the idea of beginning his story in a meaningful, original way. Once upon a time. Nice beginning, to bore everyone. In the small town of S, I lived. Somewhat better, if one takes into account that he already prepares the denouement. Or enter in media's res, go to hell. The student Nathaniel exclaimed angrily, his eyes full of fury and fright, when the seller of barometers Giuseppe Coppola. I had already begun to write that way when I thought I saw something mocking in Nathaniel's enraged look, although the story is not at all fun. No phrase came to mind that would reflect the burst of colors of the image that shone within me. I decided then not to start. Take, dear reader, the three letters that my friend Lotario invited me to share as the outline of the painting that I will strive, in the course of the narrative, to animate with more and more color, to the best of my ability. Perhaps, like a good portrait painter, he manages to give a character an expressive touch so that when you see it you find it similar to the original, even without knowing it, and it will seem to you to see it in person. Perhaps you will believe, reader, that there is nothing so wonderful and fantastic as real life, and that the poet is limited to picking up a pale shine, as in an unpolished mirror. So that from the beginning it is clear what it is necessary to know, it is necessary to add as a clarification to the letters that, immediately after the death of Nathaniel's father, Clara and Lotario, children of a distant relative also recently deceased, were collected by the mother of that one Clara and Nathaniel felt a strong mutual inclination, against which no one had anything to oppose. They were, then, engaged when Nathaniel left the city to continue his studies in G. Here he is writing his last letter and attending the course of the famous physics professor Spallanzani. Now I could continue my story calmly, 
but the image of Clara appears before my eyes so full of life that I cannot tear her away from me, as always happened to me when she looked at me sweetly. It couldn't be said that Clara was beautiful, at least that's what those connoisseurs of beauty thought. However, the architects praised the purity of the lines of his waist, the painters said that her neck, her shoulders, and her bosom were perhaps too chaste, but everyone loved her marvelous hair that was reminiscent of that of the Madeline and the color of her complexion matched, worthy of a bat Tony. One of them, a true extravagant, compared his eyes to a Roystal lake, where the blue of the sky, the color of the forest and the flowers of the field, the peaceful life, are reflected. Poets and virtuosos went further and said, How they speak of lakes and mirrors. We cannot contemplate this girl without her gaze making celestial songs and harmonies sprout from our souls that overwhelm and encourage us. Don't we sing too, and sometimes we even think we read in Clara's faint smile that it's like a song, despite some dissonant tones? That's how it was. Clara possessed the joyful and lively imagination of an innocent child, the soul of a tender and delicate woman and a penetrating and lucid intelligence. The light and presumptuous spirits had nothing to do by her side, because she, without many words, in accordance with her silent temperament, seemed to say to them with her transparent gaze and her ironic smile, Dear friends, do you want me to look at your sad shadows like authentic figures animated and alive? For this reason Clara was accused by many of being cold, prosaic and insensitive. But others, who saw life more clearly, fervently loved this lovely young girl, but no one as much as Nat Neal, who devoted himself to science and the arts with passion. Clara reciprocated with all her soul. The first clouds of sadness passed through his life when he separated from her. With what joy she threw herself into his arms when he, returning to his hometown, entered his mother's house, as he had announced in his last letter to Lotario. Then what Nathaniel had imagined happened, the moment he saw Clara again, the image of the lawyer Capelius in Clara's fatal and reasonable letter, which had so annoyed him, disappeared. However, Nathaniel was right when he wrote to his friend Lotario that his encounter with the disgusting barometer salesman had had a disastrous influence on his life. Everyone felt from the first days of their stay that Nathaniel had changed his way of being. He fell into gloomy reveries and behaved in a strange way, not usual for him. Life was only dreams and presentiments, he always talked about how men, believing themselves to be free, are only toys of dark powers, and they must humbly settle for what fate has in store for them. He went even further, and affirmed that it was crazy to believe that art and science can be created at will, since the exaltation necessary to create does not come from within us but from an external force that we do not own. Clara did not agree with these mystical delusions but it was useless to refute them. Only when Nathaniel affirmed that Capelius was the evil principle that had seized him at the moment he hid behind the curtain to observe him, and that this enemy demon would disturb his blissful love, did Clara say seriously. Yes, Nathaniel, you're right, Capelius is an evil and enemy principle, he can act in a frightening way, like a diabolic force that visibly enters your life, but only if you don't banish him from your thoughts and your soul. As long as you believe in it, it will exist, its power is in your credulity. Nathaniel, irritated to see that Clara only admitted the existence of the devil within her, wanted to prove it to her by means of mystical doctrines of demons and dark forces, but Clara interrupted the discussion with an indifferent phrase, much to Nathaniel's annoyance. He then thought that cold souls contained these deep mysteries without knowing it, and that Clara belonged to this secondary nature, for which reason he decided to do everything possible to initiate her into such secrets. The next day, while Clara was preparing breakfast, 
she went to her side and began to read various passages from mystical books, until Clara said. But, my dear Nathaniel, what if I considered you as the diabolic principle that acts against my coffee? Because, if I spent the day listening to you while you read and looking into your eyes the way you want, the coffee would boil on the fire and you wouldn't have any for breakfast. Nathaniel slammed the book shut and went grumpily to his room. Once he had written pleasant, lively stories that Clara listened to with indescribable pleasure, but now his compositions were gloomy, incomprehensible, vague and he could feel in Clara's indulgent silence that they were not to his liking. Nothing was worse for Clara than boredom, her look and her words revealed that sleep was taking over her. Nathaniel's works were in fact very boring. His disgust for Clara's cold and prosaic character grew, and Clara could not overcome the bad mood that Nathaniel's gloomy and boring mysticism produced in her, and so, their souls were moving away from each other, without realizing it. The image of the hateful Capelius, as Nathaniel himself could recognize, grew paler in his fancy, and it often cost him an effort to bring it to life and color in his poems, where he appeared as a hideous scarecrow of fate. Finally, the tormented foreboding that Capelius would destroy their love inspired the theme of one of his compositions. He described himself and Clara united by a faithful love, but from time to time a threatening hand appeared in his life and took away their joy. When they finally met before the altar, the horrible Capelius appeared, touching Clara's wonderful eyes. They jumped into Nathaniel's chest like fiery, burning bloody sparks, then Capelius seized him, hurled him into a circle of fire that whirled with the speed of the storm and carried him away with a muffled roar, a roar as when the hurricane whips the foam of the waves in the sea, which rise, like black giants with white heads, in furious fight. In the midst of that wild roar he heard Clara's voice. Can't you look at me? Capelius has deceived you, it was not my eyes that burned in your chest, they were burning drops of blood from your own heart. I have my eyes, look at me. Nathaniel thinks, it is Clara, and I am eternally hers. It is as if he dominates the circle of fire where he stands, and the muffled roar disappears into a black abyss. Nathaniel looks at Clara's eyes, but it is death that contemplates him in a friendly way with Clara's eyes. While Nathaniel was writing this poem, he was very calm and thoughtful, he filed and perfected each line, and completely devoted to rhyming, he did not rest until. Make everything pure and harmonious. When he finished and read the poem aloud, horror seized him and he exclaimed in horror. Whose is that horrible voice? It immediately seemed to him, however, that he had written an excellent poem, and that it could inflame Clara's cold spirit, without realizing that in this way he would be able to startle her with terrible images that foreshadowed a fatal destiny that would destroy their love. Nathaniel and Clara were sitting in their mother's little garden. Clara was very happy because Nathaniel, for the three days during which he had worked on the poem, had not tormented her with his dreams and premonitions. Nathaniel also talked with enthusiasm and joy about funny things, so Clara said. Now I have you again, do you see how we have banished the hateful Capelius? Nathaniel then remembered that he had the poem in his pocket and that he wanted to. Read it to him he took out the pages and began his reading. Clara, expecting something boring as usual, and resigning herself, began to knit. But, just as the black and darkening clouds are rising, she dropped her needlework and looked into Nathaniel's eyes. He followed his reading, fascinated, with flushed cheeks and tear-filled eyes. When he finished, he sighed deeply, took Clara's hand, and sobbing, he exclaimed disconsolately. Oh, Clara, Clara! 
Clara hugged him to her chest and said gently but seriously, Nathaniel, dear Nathaniel, throw that crazy and absurd story into the fire. Nathaniel got up indignant and exclaimed, pulling away from Clara, you're an inanimate and cursed automaton, and he ran away. Clara began to cry bitterly, and said between her sobs, she has never loved me, because she doesn't understand me. Lothario appeared in the gazebo and Clara had to tell him what had happened, since she loved her sister with all her soul, each of her complaints fell like a spark inside her, so that the disgust that she had carried in her heart for a long time against the visionary Nathaniel was transformed into a terrible anger. He ran after him and reproached him with such harsh words for his crazy conduct towards his beloved sister, that the fiery Nathaniel answered in the same way. The insults of fatuous, senseless and crazy, were answered by those of unfortunate and vulgar. The duel was inevitable. They decided to fight the next morning behind the garden and according to academic rules, with sharp foils. They parted grim and silent. Clara had heard the violent discussion, and when she saw that the godfather brought the foils at sunset, she had a premonition of what was going to happen. Arriving at the place of challenge, they took off their coats in the midst of a profound silence, and were about to pounce on each other with eyes flashing with bloody ardor, when Clara appeared at the garden gate. Separating them, he exclaimed between sobs. You crazy, savages, you will have to kill me before one of you falls. How could I continue to live in this world if my beloved killed my brother or my brother killed my beloved? Lotario dropped the weapon and lowered his eyes in silence, but Nathaniel felt reborn within himself all the strength of his love for Clara in the same way that he had felt in the beautiful days of youth. The murder weapon fell from his hands and he threw himself at Clara's feet saying, Can you ever forgive me, my dear Clara, my only love? Can you forgive me, dear brother Lotario? Lotario was moved to see the deep pain of his friend. Shedding abundant tears, the three embraced and swore to remain united by love and fidelity. It seemed to Nathaniel that he had freed himself from a heavy burden that oppressed him, as if he had freed himself from a dark power that threatened his entire being. He remained for another three happy days with his loved ones until he returned to G, where he was to remain for another year before returning forever to his native city. Everything about Capelius was hidden from Nathaniel's mother, for they knew that she could not think without horror of that man whom, like Nathaniel, she blamed for her husband's death. What would not be Nathaniel's surprise when, upon arriving at his house in G, he saw that it had completely burned down, and that only the walls and a pile of rubble remained. The fire had started in the chemist's laboratory, located on the ground floor. Several friends who lived near the burned house had bravely managed to enter Nathaniel's room, located on the top floor, and save his books, manuscripts and instruments, which they moved to another house where they rented a room in which Nathaniel settled. He did not realize at first that Professor Spallanzani lived across the street, and it did not particularly attract his attention to observe that from his window he could see into the room where Olympia was sitting alone. He could clearly recognize her silhouette, although the features of her face were still blurred. But he ended up being surprised that Olympia remained in the same position, just as he had discovered her the first time through the glass door, without any occupation, sitting next to the little table, with her gaze fixed, invariably directed towards him. He had to confess that he had never seen a beauty like hers, but the image of Clara was still installed in his heart, and the motionless Olympias was indifferent to him and only from time to time he directed a furtive glance over his book. Towards the girl. Beautiful statue, that was all. One day I was writing to Clara when there was a soft knock on the door. Opening it, 
he saw the disgusting face of Coppola. Nathaniel shuddered, but remembering what Spallanzani had told him of his compatriot Coppola and what he had promised his beloved in connection with the Sandman, he was ashamed of his childish fear, and summoned all his strength to say as calmly as possible. I don't buy barometers, friend, so go away. But Coppola, entering the room, said to him hoarsely, his mouth twisting into a hateful smile and his small eyes shining under long gray lashes. Hey, no barometers, no barometers. I also have beautiful eyes, beautiful eyes. Nathaniel, shocked, exclaimed. Damn crazy. How can you have eyes? Eyes. Eyes. Immediately Coppola put the barometers aside and began to remove glasses and spectacles from the immense pocket of his coat, which he left on the table. Glasses to put on the nose. Those are my eyes, beautiful eyes. And, as he spoke, he kept taking out more and more glasses, so many that they began to shine and sparkle on the table. Thousands of eyes flashed and stared at Nathaniel, but he could not tear his gaze from the table, and Coppola continued to pull out more and more glasses and more and more terrible the fiery glares that shot their bloody rays into Nathaniel's chest. The latter, seized with terror, cried out. Stop, damn man! Taking him by the arm at the moment when Coppola plunged his hand into his pocket again to take out more glasses, even though the table was already covered with them. Coppola parted from him gently with a forced smile, saying, Ah, they are not for you, but here I have beautiful binoculars. And picking up the glasses he began to take out binoculars of all sizes from the immense pocket. As soon as all the glasses were put away, Nathaniel calmed down, and remembering Clara, he realized that the horrible ghost was only inside her, since Coppola was a great mechanic and optician, and in no way the double of the damned Coppelius. On the other hand, the glasses that Coppola had spread out on the table had nothing special, and less than spooky, so Nathaniel decided, to repair his strange behavior, buy him something. He selected a small, well-wrought pair of binoculars and, to test them, looked through the window. Never in his life had he used binoculars with which objects could be seen with such clarity and purity. Involuntarily he looked toward Spallanzani's room. Olympia was seated, as usual, at the little table, with her arms resting on it and her hands crossed. For the first time Nathaniel could contemplate the beauty of her face. Only the eyes seemed to him somewhat fixed, dead. However, as he looked more and more through the binoculars, it seemed to him that Olympia's eyes radiated moist moonbeams. She believed that she was seeing for the first time and that her looks were becoming more and more alive and brilliant. Nathaniel remained as if spellbound by the window absorbed in the contemplation of the celestial beauty of Olympia. A slight throat clearing woke him as if from a deep sleep. Coppola was behind him. Tre zucchini. Three ducats. Nathaniel, who had completely forgotten the optician, hastened to pay him. Is not true. Good binoculars, good binoculars said Coppola with his disgusting voice and hateful smile. Yes, yes, replied Nathaniel annoyed. Goodbye my dear friend. Coppola left the room, but not before casting a sideways glance at Nathaniel, who heard him laugh out loud as he went down the stairs. No doubt, thought Nathaniel, he's laughing at me because I've paid more expensive binoculars than they're worth. As he said these words in a low voice, he thought he heard a deep sigh in the room that made him hold his breath in awe of horror. He realized that it was he himself who had sighed like that. Clara was right, he told himself, 
to consider me a visionary, but the absurdity, more than absurd, is that the idea of having paid Coppola for binoculars more expensive than they are worth terrifies me, and I can't find what may be the reason. He sat down again to finish the letter to Clara, but a glance towards the window made him see that Olympia was still sitting there, and instantly, pushed by an irresistible force, he grabbed Coppola's binoculars and could no longer tear himself away from the seductive woman. Olympia's gaze until his friend Segismundo came looking for him to attend Professor Spallanzani's class. From that day on, the curtain on the glass door was completely drawn, so he could not see Olympia, and for the next two days he did not find her in the room either, although he hardly moved away from the window, looking through the binoculars. On the third day the window was closed. Filled with despair and possessed of delirium and burning desire, he left the city. The image of Olympias hung before him in the air, appearing in every bush and looking up at him with radiant eyes from the clear stream. The memory of Clara had been erased, she only thought of Olympia and she moaned and sobbed. Star of my love! Why have you risen to disappear suddenly and leave me in a dark and desperate night? When Nathaniel returned to his house, he observed a great agitation in Spallanzani's. The doors were open, and some men were bringing in furniture, the first floor windows were open, too, and busy maids came and went while carpenters and upholsterers pounded and hammered throughout the house. Nathaniel, astonished, stopped in the middle of the street. Segismundo approached him smiling and said, What about our old friend Spallanzani? Nathaniel assured that he could not say anything, since he knew nothing about him, and that he was quite surprised that that silent and gloomy house was involved in such a great tumult and activity. Segismundo then told him that the next day Spallanzani was giving a big party with a concert and dance to which half the university was invited. It was rumored that Spallanzani was going to introduce his daughter Olympia for the first time, whom until then he had kept hidden, with extreme care, from everyone's eyes. Nathaniel found an invitation, and with a beating heart, he set out at the appointed time for the professor's house, just as the carriages were beginning to arrive and the lights were shining in the ornate halls. The gathering was large and brilliant. Olympia appeared richly dressed, with exquisite taste. Everyone admired the perfection of her face and figure. The slight slope of her shoulders seemed to be caused by the oppressed slenderness of her wasp waist. His walk had something measured and rigid. It caused a bad impression on many, and was attributed to the embarrassment caused by so many people. The concert started. Olympia played the piano with extreme skill, and she delivered an aria in a voice so clear and penetrating that it sounded like the sound of a crystal bell. Nathaniel was fascinated, he was in one of the last rows and the glare from the chandeliers prevented him from seeing Olympia's features. Without being seen, he took out Coppola's glasses and looked at the beautiful Olympia. Ah! Then he felt the longing glances that she directed at him, and that each note was accompanied by a look of love that ardently traversed him. The brilliant notes seemed to Nathaniel the heavenly lament of a loving heart, and when at last the cadence of the long trill rang through the room, it seemed to him that a burning arm was encircling him ecstatic, he could not contain himself and exclaimed aloud. Olympia! All eyes turned to him. Some laughed. The cathedral organist looked somber and said simply, Good good. The concert was over and the dance began. Dancing with her, dancing with her, was now his highest wish, his highest aspiration, but how could he have the courage to invite her, the queen of the party? Without even knowing how, he found himself next to Olympias, whom no one had yet removed, when the dance began, and after trying to stammer a few words, he took her hand. 
Olympia's hand was frozen and he felt deathly cold run through him. He stared into her eyes, which radiated love and desire, and instantly it seemed to him that the pulse began to beat in his cold hand and that hot blood coursed through his veins. Nathaniel, too, felt an ardent voluptuousness within him. He encircled the waist of the beautiful Olympias and carried her through the crowd of guests. He thought he had danced to the beat, but the rhythmic regularity with which Olympia danced, which sometimes forced him to stop, made him immediately notice that he was not following the beat. He would not dance with any other woman, and would have killed anyone who came to Olympia to request a dance. If Nathaniel had been able to see more than Olympia, he would not have been able to avoid a fight, for mocking murmurs and barely muffled laughter escaped from among the groups of young people, whose curious glances were directed at Olympia without knowing why. Excited by the dance and by the wine, he had lost his natural shyness. Sitting next to Olympia and with his hand in hers, he spoke to her of his exalted and inspired love in words that no one, neither he nor Olympia, could have understood. Or perhaps Olympia did, for she looked him straight in the eye and from time to time sighed. Ah, ah, ah. To which Nathaniel responded. Oh, celestial woman, divine creature, light that is promised to us in the other life, deep soul where my whole being is seen. And similar things. But Olympia sighed and answered only. Ah, ah. Professor Spallanzani passed the happy lover several times and smiled with satisfaction. Although Nathaniel found himself in a different world, it seemed to him that it was suddenly dark in Professor Spallanzani's house. He looked around and observed with horror that the last two candles were consumed and were about to go out. The dancing and music had long ceased. Separate, separate. Nathaniel exclaimed furiously and desperately. He kissed Olympia's hand and bent over her mouth, his burning lips met hers icy. He shuddered as when he had first touched Olympia's cold hand, and the legend of the dead bride came suddenly to his mind, but when he embraced and kissed Olympia his lips seemed to take on the warmth of life. Professor Spallanzani walked slowly through the empty room, his footsteps echoing hollowly in his figure, surrounded by flickering shadows, looking eerie. Do you love me? Do you love me, Olympia? Only a word. Nathaniel murmured. But Olympias, getting up, sighed alone. Ah, ah. Yes, beloved star of my love. Said Nathaniel Dash. You are the light that will illuminate my soul forever. Ah, ah. Olympia replied, moving away. Nathaniel followed her, and they stopped in front of the professor. I see that you have had a very good time with my daughter, said the latter smiling, so if you are pleased to talk to this shy girl, your visit will be well received. Nathaniel left, carrying heaven in his heart. The following day the Spallanzani party was the center of the conversations. Despite the fact that the professor had done everything possible to make the meeting splendid, there was much criticism and it was directed especially against the mute and rigid Olympias, whom, despite her beauty, they considered completely stupid, it was thought that this was the reason why Spallanzani had kept it hidden for so long. Nathaniel listened to these things with rage, but kept quiet, for he thought that those wretches did not deserve to be shown that it was their own stupidity that prevented them from knowing the beauty of Olympia's soul. Tell me, please, friend, Segismundo said to him one day, tell me, how is it possible that a sensible person like you has fallen in love with the waxen face of a doll? Nathaniel was going to respond angrily, but he calmed down and replied. Tell me, Segismundo, 
How is it possible that Olympia's celestial charms have gone unnoticed by your clairvoyant eyes? But I thank fate for not having you as a rival, because one of the two would have had to die at the hands of the other. Segismundo realized his friend's condition and diverted the conversation saying that in love it was very difficult to judge, to later add. It is very strange that most of us have judged Olympias in the same way. It seemed to us, don't get angry, friend, something rigid and soulless. Her figure is proportionate, like her face, it is true. She could appear beautiful if her gaze were not devoid of rays of life, I mean vision. His step is strangely rhythmic, and each of his movements seems to be triggered by a mechanism. Her singing, her musical interpretation has that regular and uncomfortable rhythm that reminds us of the operation of a machine, and the same thing happens when she dances. Olympia is very disturbing to us, we don't want to have anything to do with her, because it seems to us that she behaves like a living being but that she belongs to a different nature. Nathaniel did not want to give in to the bitterness that the words of Sigismund. He made an effort to contain himself and simply replied very seriously. For you, prosaic and cold souls, Olympia is disturbing. Only to the spirit of a poet is revealed a personality that is similar to it. His gaze of love and his thoughts have turned to me alone, only in Olympia's love have I found myself again. It doesn't seem right to you that Olympia doesn't participate in vulgar conversations, as superficial people do. He speaks little, it is true. But those few words are for me like hieroglyphics of an inner world full of love and knowledge of spiritual life in the contemplation of eternity. I know that this for you does not make any sense, and it is in vain to talk about it. May God protect you, brother," said Segismundo softly, almost painfully, but I think you're on the wrong track. You can count on me if all, no. I don't want to say anything else. Nathaniel suddenly understood that the cold and matter-of-fact Segismundo had just shown his loyalty to him, and he heartily shook the hand that he offered. He had completely forgotten that there was a Clara in the world whom he had loved, his mother, Lotario, all had disappeared from his memory. He lived only for Olympia with whom he spent long hours every day talking to her about his love. Of the sympathy of souls and of psychic affinities, all of which Olympia listened with great attention. Nathaniel took from the most remote places of his desk everything he had written, poetry, fantasies, visions, novels, stories, and all this was increased with all kinds of nonsensical sonnets, stanzas, songs that he read to Olympia for hours without getting tired. I had never had such an admirable listener. She did not sew or knit, she did not look out of the window, she did not feed a bird or play with a puppy or her favorite cat, she did not cut papers or the like, nor did she have to cover a yawn with a forced cough, in a word, she would remain for hours with her eyes fixed on him, immobile and her gaze was each time brighter and more animated. Only when Nathaniel, at the end, took her hand to kiss it, did he say, Oh! Oh! And then, good night, my love! Sensitive and deep soul! Nathaniel exclaimed in his room dash, Only you understand me! He trembled with happiness at the thought of the intellectual affinities that existed between them and that were increasing every day, he seemed to hear the voice of Olympia inside him, that she spoke in her works. It had to be so, since Olympia never uttered other words than those already mentioned. But when Nathaniel remembered Olympia's moments of lucidity, passivity, and silence, for example, when she got up in the morning and fasting, he said to himself, What are words? Words! The heavenly look in her eyes says more than all tongues. 
Can a creature from heaven be enclosed in the narrow circle of our way of expressing ourselves? Professor Spallanzani seemed to take great pleasure in his daughter's relationship with Nathaniel, lavishing him with all kinds of attention, so that when he dared to suggest a marriage with Olympia, the professor, with a big smile, said that he would leave his daughter choose freely. Encouraged by these words and with his heart burning with desire, Nathaniel decided to ask Olympia the next day to tell him in words what her looks had made him understand for a long time, that she would be his forever. She looked for the ring that her mother gave her when she said goodbye, to offer it to Olympia as a symbol of eternal union. Clara's and Lotario's letters fell into his hands, he brushed them aside nonchalantly. He found the ring and, putting it on his finger, he ran back to Olympia's side. Going up the stairs, and when he was already in the hall, he heard a loud crash that seemed to come from Spallanzani's study. Footsteps, creaks, knocks against the door, mixed with curses and swearing. Loose. Let go at once. Infamous. Miserable. For this I have sacrificed my life. This was not the deal. I made the eyes. And I the gears. Damn watchdog. Get out of here, Satan. Get out of here, infernal beast. It was the voices of Spallanzani and the horrible Capelius that mixed and echoed together. Nathaniel, seized with fear, rushed into the room. The professor was holding a woman's body by the shoulders, and the Italian Coppola was pulling. Feet, fighting furiously to seize it. Nathaniel backed away horrified when he recognized Olympia's face, full of anger, he wanted to tear his beloved from those savages. But immediately Coppola, with the strength of a giant, managed to seize it while unloading a tremendous blow on the professor who fell on a table full of flasks, cylinders and alembics, which broke into a thousand pieces. Coppola threw her body on her back and hurried down the stairs with a horrible laugh, Olympia's feet tapped with a wooden sound on the steps. Nathaniel remained motionless. He had seen that Olympia's pale waxen face had no eyes, and that in their place were black cavities, she was a lifeless doll. Spallanzani lay on the ground amid broken glass that had injured his head, chest and arm, and was bleeding profusely. Gathering strength he said. Run after him. Runs. What are you waiting for? Capelius has stolen my best automaton. Twenty years of work. I have sacrificed my life. The gears, the voice, the step, were mine, the eyes, I have stolen your eyes, cursed, run after him. Give me back my Olympia. Here are the eyes. Then Nathaniel saw on the ground a pair of bloody eyes that were staring at him. Spallanzani picked them up and tossed them to his chest. Delirium seized him and, confused with his senses and his thoughts, he said. Woe, woe. Circle of fire. Circle of fire. Spin, circle of fire. Cute little wooden doll, spin. What fun. And rushing at the professor, he seized him by the neck. I would have strangled him, but the noise attracted some people who knocked down and then tied up the angry Nathaniel, thus saving the professor. Segis Mundo, although he was very strong, could barely hold his friend, who kept shouting in a terrible voice. Spin, little wooden doll, hitting punches around her. Finally they managed to dominate it among several. His words continued to be heard like a wild roar, and so, in his delirium, he was driven to the madhouse. Before continuing, O oh gentle reader, with the story of the unfortunate Nathaniel, I can tell you, 
since you will be interested in the mechanic and automata manufacturer Spallanzani, who made a complete recovery from his injuries. He had been forced to drop out of college because Nathaniel's story had produced such a sensation, and the fact that he had introduced a wooden doll to tea circles, where he had had some success, was considered intolerable everywhere. The lawyers found the deception all the more punishable because it had been directed against the public and so cunningly that no one, except some very intelligent students, had suspected anything, although now they all said they had suspected it. For some, including an elegant regular at tea parties, it was suspicious that Olympia sneezed more often than she yawned, which was against all the rules. That was due, according to the elegant, to the internal mechanism that creaked in a different way, and so on. The professor of poetry and eloquence took some snuff and said cheerfully, Honorable ladies and gentlemen, you don't realize what the crux of the matter is. Everything has been an allegory, a continuous metaphor. Do you understand? Sapienti sat. But many honorable people were not content with that explanation, the story of the automaton had made a profound impression on them, and a terrible mistrust of human figures spread among them. Many lovers, for To convince themselves that their beloved was not a wooden doll, they forced her to dance and sing without following the beats, to knit or sew while they listened to the reading, to play with the dog, etc., and, above all, to not just listen, but also had to speak, so that his sensitivity and thinking were appreciated. In some cases, the love ties became closer, in others, this was the cause of numerous ruptures. We can't go on like this, they all said. Now in tease he yawned incredibly and never sneezed to avoid suspicion. As we have already said, Spallanzani had to flee to avoid a criminal investigation for having deceived society with an automaton. Coppola also disappeared. Nathaniel woke up one day as if from a painful and deep sleep, opened his eyes, and a feeling of infinite well-being and heavenly warmth invaded him. He was lying in his room, in his father's house. Clara was leaning over him and, next to her, her mother and Lothario. At last, at last, dear Nathaniel. You have been cured of a serious disease. You are mine again. This is how Clara spoke, full of tenderness, hugging Nathaniel who murmured through tears. Clara, my Clara. Segismundo, who had not abandoned his friend, entered the room. Nathaniel shook his hand. Brother, you have not abandoned me. All traces of madness had disappeared, and very soon the care of his mother, his beloved, and his friends restored his strength. Happiness returned to that house, because an old uncle, whom no one remembered, had just died and had left his mother an extensive estate near the city as an inheritance. The whole family intended to go there, the mother, Lotario, and Nathaniel and Clara, who were going to get married. Nathaniel was kinder than ever. He had recovered the naivety of his childhood and appreciated Clara's pure and heavenly soul. No one reminded him of the past even in the smallest detail. Only when Segismundo went to say goodbye to him did he say, God knows well, brother, that I was on the wrong path, but an angel has led me in time to the path of light. That angel has been Clara. Segismundo did not allow him to continue speaking, fearing that he would sink into painful thoughts. The time came when the four of them, happy, were going to head towards their country house. During the day they shopped in the city center. The tall tower of the town hall cast its gigantic shadow over the market. Let's go up the tower to see the mountains, said Claire. No sooner said than done, Nathaniel and Clara went up to the tower, the mother returned home with the maid, 
and Lotario, who didn't feel like going up so many steps, preferred to wait downstairs. Immediately the two lovers found themselves, arm in arm, in the highest gallery of the tower, contemplating the thickness of the forests, behind which the blue mountain range rose, like a city of giants. Do you see those bushes that seem to be coming towards us? asked Claire. Nathaniel instinctively reached into his pocket and pulled out Coppola's binoculars. To the raising them to his eyes, he saw the image of Clara before him. His pulse began to pound violently in his veins, pale as death, he stared at Clara. His eyes flashed and he began to roar like a wild animal, then he began to jump while saying laughing out loud. Turn, little wooden doll, spin. And, seizing Clara, he wanted to rush her from the gallery, but, in her desperation, Clara grabbed the railing. Lotario heard the madman's furious laughter and Clara's screams of fright, a terrible premonition seized him and he ran up the stairs. The door to the second stairway was closed. Clara's screams increased and, Blind with rage and terror, she pushed the door until it gave way. Clara's voice was weakening. Help, save me, save me. His voice died in the air. That madman is going to kill her. Lothair exclaimed. The door to the gallery was also closed. Desperation gave her strength and made her jump off her hinges. God of heaven! Nathaniel was holding Clara in the air, who was still holding on to the railing with one hand. Lotario seized his sister with the speed of lightning. He struck Nathaniel in the face, forcing him to release his grip. Then she went downstairs with her passed out sister in her arms. I was saved. Nathaniel ran and jumped around the gallery shouting. Circle of fire, turn, circle of fire. The crowd gathered at the wild shouts, and among them the tallest lawyer Capelius, who had just arrived in the city and was in the market, stood out. When someone suggested climbing the tower to subdue the fool, Capelius laughed. You just have to wait, it will go down on its own, and he kept looking up like the others. Nathaniel stopped suddenly and stared down, and seeing Capelius cried out in a shrill voice. Ah, beautiful eyes, beautiful eyes! And jumped into the void. When Nathaniel was left lying with his head broken on the flagstones of the street, Capelius disappeared. Someone claims to have seen Clara years later, in a remote region, sitting next to her happy husband in front of a beautiful country house. Next to them played two lovely children. One could conclude by saying that Clara finally found the calm and domestic happiness that corresponded to her sweet and cheerful character and that she would never have enjoyed with the fiery and exalted Nathaniel.